saying, Paul Rossi, um, manned aircraft, unmanned aircraft pilot. Um, I have the opportunity to work with uh, one of the great drone companies out there, 910 Drones. Um, and we've had the opportunity to work with a couple other companies to bring you this uh, webinar and educational content. Uh, I'd like to mention them now. So working with Fox Fury uh, Lighting Solutions, uh, FLIR Systems, and Insight Fire Training, um, all of us uh, together, again, are bringing you this webinar series uh, relating to drone use in public safety. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to bring in all of our uh, panelists, and we're just going to move right into our discussion. And I'll bring everybody on, and I'll introduce everybody. So we have with us uh, Barry Moore. Barry Moore is a retired police officer with the Mansfield PD and uh, is uh, working with the North a member of the North Texas PSERT. We also have Garrett Brill. Uh, Garrett Brill as well is a, a member of the North Texas PSERT. Um, Rick Smith is joining us from uh, California. He's a sergeant and UAS coordinator with the Antioch Police Department. And also joining us is uh, Guillaume Delapine. He's uh, the product marketing manager and former public safety lead for uh, Skydio. So I'm excited to have everybody on. Thanks for, for joining. And what we're gonna move into first is indoor UAS flight. So bring this up. Thank you for bearing with us. Now, can everybody see that? You guys, panelists, we have this here. Awesome. Um, so one of the things that departments, they're not only flying outside, but we see organizations uh, that are now operating indoors. Um, some of the things that we're seeing uh, indoor operations from COVID wellness checks uh, to safely inspecting a property after a burglary, burglary uh, a riot, and also during SWAT calls to add that additional layer of support. Um, indoor operations introduce, introduce new challenges uh, in relation to how the drone will uh, fly in that environment. So it's important um, about training, training, training for these types of uh, situations. So I'm gonna have Rick Smith uh, with Antioch talk first about uh, an indoor uh, flight res uh, a response to a, a call where they used a drone to fly indoors. Um, so Rick, do you have, are you unmuted here? Yep, there we go. All right, and what I'm gonna do is also I'm gonna bring up that video and I'm gonna have that video start to play and you can just kind of talk to people and walk them through um, what they're seeing. Well, I was, well, I was working on that. This was a uh, little mom and pop gas station in which it was a window smash of a burglary. We responded to an alarm. You see the opening in all the glass. We couldn't put our dog through, and some of the officers weren't going to fit through that little opening. So we sent in a uh, Mavic Air that's equipped for it. Things to be thinking of are, you know, prop guards, lighting, things of that nature. At the same time, having a good uh, signal with you know no outside interference at the same time you got to think about your officer safety in case someone is in there we got a perimeter set up around the business didn't know how he came out because he didn't come out the way he went in we believe it went out an exterior door sent the drone in to clear it because the uh key holder had about an hour eta to show up some of the obstacles we encountered in there were the bulletproof glass around the register area had about a 24 inch opening at the top that we were able to fly up and over to get to the back stock room and clear it. So by the time the key holder got there, we knew the business was cleared. So I could have free up my resources, didn't have to hold a perimeter no more with my graveyard units, allow them to go off to have other calls. When the key holder got there, was went in and confirmed the loss and took our documentation and said everyone on the way. And I apologize for this, tech, again, more technical difficulties. I'm bringing that video up now. No problem. This is where, while well, he's getting this up, it comes in, you have to practice this. This isn't something you can just do cold and never done it before. Because you're gonna need to understand how prop wash is gonna affect your drone when you're going over shelving, other obstacles, 
you know, what happens if you bump into a wall? If you don't have prop guards, your, your drone's down. So having the proper lighting, because you'll find indoor flight, nighttime flight, the sensors don't work very well without light. So without having the proper light, thanks to Antonio, we use his uh, 3060 lights. Those things are amazing. Um, and we had to get some accomplishments or, or uh, some workarounds to make them attach to that Mavic Air. And basically just putting Velcro on the bottom of our batteries and Velcro on the light. So every time we did battery swap, swap the light to the new battery. That didn't throw off the center of balance for the drone. Um, it wasn't too much of a payload. Another workaround we had to find were some feet extensions or leg extensions for the landing gear. So if it came down, it didn't like tilt to one side or the other and throw off the IMU. So that's just things, like I said, training and testing you come across. And if you don't do that, it just doesn't work. As I could consider there that train, train, train. Well, I just call it burning batteries. Put those batteries through their cycles, get your pilots on the sticks and make them fly. Uh, we train probably at least once a month, indoor flight, outdoor flight. And I don't make it easy on them. I'll find a house and put them through it. Or I'll find the PD, you know, one few times we've flown through the chief's office just to show the chief how good we are with it. Are we seeing this? Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I'm seeing your screen. A blank, just the desktop or the slide? Des desktop. Are you seeing desktop? Well, you're in the view mode of the PowerPoint. There's the PowerPoint itself now. Okay, are we playing video now? Play. Yeah. But it also, at the same time of having this indoor flight send the drone in, just like, I hate to say it, our canine, it's a resource that saves an officer's life. These things, you might have a suspect that we caught in the process could be hiding in there. I don't care if he knocks my drone out of the air. Then I know he's there and I can actually up the response. Um, it's going to save a life when he sending an officer in there, getting involved into a shooting, a tussle in a small space. And again, we're reacting we're, to what they're doing. They know their game plan. They could be hiding somewhere. And it's like hide and seek, jump out and grab my officer. And I don't want to see that happen. I use these as a tool to save a life, and that's what this biggest thing is, is officer safety. Um, and it also gives us the layout of the land we're flying through, like on a, we do this for a SWAT operation. We'll know the actual layout, where furniture is. Yeah, we'll have the floor plan of the house, but this gives us the actual layout. The video is typically pretty smooth, but I think you're tracking along it, but it let us fly the entire business. There's a clip in there I don't think it made, but we actually got up in the attic through an open thing and figured out he came in through, this, through the attic. He climbed up a storm drain pipe, cut a hole in the rooftop and dropped down in. Then, but my pilot was able to fly up into the attic and fly through and we found his entrance and he actually flew out the roof. The same way the guy came in, my pilot flew out. Yeah, that's <laughs> really excellent. And I apologize for those uh, little bits. Again, continued te technical difficulties. Um, but being able, like you said, you have that window where you don't want to send a canine through because it's not necessarily safe. Um, and it's not even a huge property, but anyone in there that's, that's hiding, um, you know, depending on what they have or what they've done, they're not just going to announce themselves, you know, no matter how many people are outside. So being able to put that drone in there is, is really, really good. Um, and thank you everyone for kind of rolling with this. Um, next, what I want to throw up here on the screen and uh, move over to is involves uh, some stuff that Garrett did recently, again, with also indoor uh, flight operations. We have, we have the screen. Can we see indoor flight, everybody? Showing the the it's not the presentation yet. It's, it's, it's what you uh, there you go. Okay. And uh, Garrett, this year I'll just kind of set this up a little bit again. Indoor flight, um, and instead of using that visual, now we're uh, using that thermal. And and I think you can go into more detail on this on the conditions of what was going on inside. Right. 
Okay, so this is with the new Autcell Evo 2 Dual. Uh, we've been running it through a test matrix, a public safety test matrix. Uh, this was the first time that we had flown it indoors. This is the, the infamous gauntlet. And one of the cool things is that uh, this was in this you, first time that we've ever been able to fly in complete darkness, no lights, no anything. And you can see how easy it is to see a potential suspect. In this case, he's holding a rifle. And uh, but you can see how clear. Now that that's in a room, and he's probably set back uh, about a good 20 feet uh, from where we're at. And you can see everything uh, on the suspect itself. The performance of that sensor inside is is absolutely incredible. Yeah, that is that is really really great. And like you said, if uh, if you didn't have this thermal sensor, you would think, or you weren't familiar with the conditions that you put it in, that that it was like a you know lights were on, windows were open, but to operate in that completely dark area, uh, because like what Rick was just showing. And that you know had in that previous video it wasn't a well-lit business it was after something had happened um, in the evening time right and one one of the things that we were able to see you know um, lights work work really good um, and we use those as well uh, with, your, with your optical sometimes you want to be able to see if there's a suspect all the way down in the hallway or just if he's peeking around the corner or something like that and that really gives you the advantage of having a High quality thermal sensor interior is pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, well, those are really great uh, different cases that can give some folks, you know, an idea as far as what type of indoor operations people are starting to do. Again, if anybody that's tuning in has any questions, um, feel free to drop that into the Q and A. It'll be a little bit more easier for us to, to see and present to the panelists. Um, but also feel free to kind of go ahead and chat amongst yourselves in the chat. Um, the panelists don't get lost in the chat, though, because um, they'll be coming back to you for, for some information. Um, what I want to show now is a little bit, because when we talk about indoor operations, um, and this here might be new even to the panelists, is when we're in a confined space, we get into environments where we might bump into things, right? We, we want to have that indoor um, flight capabilities and sensing, but I'm just gonna show here um, a platform that I've had the opportunity to fly and, and, and work with and introducing to uh, different organiz organizations and uh, departments, and that's the uh, AirTOS, uh, but it's, bring that up. What's interesting is the ability for this, and I'm just gonna play this video through here, it's real. Hopefully you can't hear that audio. Sorry, but you can see, I'm gonna play that back. You can see how this drone has the ability to, to push through um, an obstacle, hit an obstacle, you know, and continue on its way. So sometimes we're, eventually we're gonna get into environments where we just kind of have to push through or get through things. and. And, you know, the industry folks in this space are already, you know, looking at, at that uh, uh, direction. So it's really interesting um, where indoor flight ops takes us. So thanks, um, Rick and Garrett, both for being able to help cover that part of this uh, webinar. What I want to move to now, and uh, I'm just having fun with these uh, bit of technical difficulties, this modeling uh, portion is going to help me clear all those out, but I wanna go now um, to Barry, and I'm gonna bring up this slide. I don't know why. Oh, here we go. I'm gonna share screen, I'm gonna bring up this slide. We're gonna just cover quickly a little bit about, you know, what, um, you know, US, uh, UAS mapping and 3D modeling. Like, what, what are folks using it? We're seeing it for quickly documenting uh, uh, and reconstruct crash scenes, both during day and night calls. Um, this gives you the ability, right, Barry, to revisit this scene multiple times to, to extract additional information that you may not have gotten previously. Um, also, which we're gonna have you cover here is the ability to also cover larger areas um, in order to raise situational awareness for upcoming uh, 
you know, activities, you know, what we're going to discuss is like counter protests, like what's happening, you know, nowadays today. So if I can kick this. Here we go. So um, crash scene reconstruction day and night. Um, I'm going to just step out of the side, Barry, and I'm going to bring in those, those uh, different models. I'm going to start with the night one. And you just want to give us, go ahead and I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I'd like Derek to unmute and step in and jump in on this too. Uh, Cause uh, he and I work really close together on this, on this modeling. First thing I want to say is I'm not an expert in 3d modeling. I just, I've been using it over the years um, from Pix4D now I'm using sky brows. Um, and we just kind of go with what, what we think works the best. And right now what we're seeing that uh, for, for quick models, for quick 3D and accuracy, uh, SkyBrows is, has been our, our go-to. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen is when you pull up a model here, we, we've, been, we've been putting hey, SkyBrows. Go ahead. Is it showing now? Yeah, there's, uh, this model here is, uh, I'm trying to figure out where you're at here because I'm not familiar with this one. But, uh, okay, this is the, yeah, this is uh, the emergency manager's office. This is where Garrett and I flew uh, the night ops. Um, you can see if this is a kind of a rural area that, that we flew uh, night ops in. And, and uh, with the assistance of the Fox Fury lights, which I can't uh, say enough about, uh, these, these Fox Fury lights are amazing. But the ability to carry these lights out in the middle of nowhere where you don't have plugs, you don't have generators, to be able to put these lights up and then, and then uh, able to produce a 3D model on a scene, uh, it's just stuff that's been unheard of in the, in the past. So if you, you know, this technology, I kind of put drone technology with like iPhone technology, it changes so fast by the time you think something's great, something else has come along. So, we're just trying to keep it up with technology and uh, with the sky brows models and, and being able to do this at night uh, really changes the game a little bit here for us. And, uh, Garrett, you got something you want to say on that? Yeah, try, try clicking outside on that. Yep. See, see if you're getting, I don't know why the, the model is out on this, but it, uh, or try zooming out this, the, um, Sky brows. We've used um, in the past. We we've, we've used Pix4D uh, a lot. In the past, uh, we used it for for all kinds of uh, different reconstruction and for accidents and everything. One of the challenges with it, though, uh, was the time and and the training and the um, really just the the expertise that it took to run it. And then uh, they came out with the React. We did use the React on a tornado strike. Um, and, it, and it worked well, but there's still, it's not practical for stuff like your everyday police scenarios, fatalities, um, crime scenes, that kind of stuff. So the, the um, sky brows comes out and it makes it, it does it extremely fast, about three minutes. You know, if, you, if the, someone can get a drone up in the air fast enough, you can even uh, you know, capture everything before anybody else gets there. And then when they start saying, hey, take measurements, uh, you can be sitting in your air-conditioned vehicle taking measurements on your tough work. It's, it's pretty incredible. So it's, it's, it's really opened up the... Right here, too. It's coming. Uh, okay. So the other, the other thing that's really... There we go. And so, yeah, so you see there with the Fox Fury lights. So one of the things that was in demand from the very beginning with all the mapping is they said... This is great, but can every, I mean, just about every officer that ever, their first question was, can I map a nighttime fatality? And prior to this, the combined technologies of Sky Browse and Fox Fury, um, prior to this, the answer was no, but the answer is yes now. And again, the, the beautiful thing about, uh, like what Barry said, the Fox Fury lights, those are the Nomad 360s. And we put four of them out there and you can capture anything you want um, from at nighttime fatality and you can do you can do accurate measurements I did some uh, testing on it to, to measure and everything was what I would call accurate down to whatever your mouse click uh, the point of your mouse so it's really supposed to be sub centimeter uh, and it is but I can't accurately click my mouse to sub centimeter but you know uh, most agencies will tell you anything within an inch is going to be just fine so um, yeah it's it's 
and again, this is not a picture. Uh, this is an actual measurable model. Uh, there's some other tools on there. I don't, I'm not real sure if you're familiar with them, Paul, but you can actually, if you needed, let's say those two vehicles were touching like this, you can actually remove one of them as long as you know, whatever captures you. There you go. You can actually highlight that and just say, hey, uh, eliminate this part. And then uh, after that, I think you want to click. Yeah. Yep, there you go. There you go. Then you can actually use one of those tools on the left side and, and eliminate that part of my truck. Yep. There you go. So there's the cutoff uh, section of the truck for crush. So that, that highlights the part of it. Click the outside button. And okay, so that's what I was talking about. So if you had two vehicles and they were together like this and you really wanted to get a better look at the front of, say, that Tahoe, you can eliminate the front of my truck and then, and then get uh, what you really need to see off of it. That's exactly what I, what I was wanting to say. And then that's non-permanent, virtual, and then you can just uh, eliminate that whole. And just exit out of it. Just hit X and then you can get out X, of it. The red X on the left side. And I'd say the really interesting is you could do, this is a nighttime model with light. So daytime, you're doing this. This is taking place very easily without any lights set up. And then right. flying it, uh, I'm gonna go back to the, this, this uh, screen here. Can you see the map now? Yes. So this is the actual flight path, correct, which the drone took. Uh, That's correct. So in a couple circles of the scene, you're able to capture and process this data um, yeah. so if very efficiently. And what I wanna show now, um, because you get a sense of, and I just wanna check, we got a couple questions. Um, that, that's a two minute flight, probably less than two minutes on that fly time right there to have that 3D model. Um, so Thomas asked, how big of an area can the four Fox Fury lights illuminate with enough light to be able to model, like a city block? No, it, it wouldn't be that much. So that, that parking lot, if you look, what we did is those cars obviously weren't there in that parking lot. And we had those uh, four lights in pretty much those four corners of that parking lot. Um, so just outside of the circle um, is where they were. You could probably illuminate maybe an area uh, twice the size of that. We, we did take one of the Fox Fury lights out into a really dark area um, and just pointed it out into a field and you could see a tree line. You could illuminate a tree line uh, that was probably about uh, 200 yards away. Okay. Something I mentioned, uh, there was a case study done, I like a uh, case study and uh, Picks and uh, Skybrows was spot on, uh, and that was an independent study. So, uh, just in case anybody's wondering, there was an independent study done on this, and uh, it was it was proven to be just as accurate. So, so you know. Uh, Thomas uh, Thomas had another follow up question, and he was asking, "Can you stitch several models together for a larger area?" So, what I want to do is let's move into this uh, larger uh, model that uh you know was recently flown and maybe thomas that will just answer your question uh, yeah. i apologize if i have these questions coming up here uh, a lot are you um, talking the jazz model or the protest the protest model okay. um this one here uh, this is the one that garrett and i did uh, a couple days ago as a matter of fact there was a protest very quickly, very, uh, well do you want me to show the do you want us to bring up the um the flight path Sure. Yeah, this was a model that uh, Garrett and I put together for a protest. Uh, this was flown with wide brows, which is uh, part of sky brows. It allows you to map very large areas um, very quickly. Uh, it's, it's, again, sky brows takes all of its images from video and not, not individual pictures. So it's flying using a video. And it's, uh, so that's what makes it so fast. Uh, but you can see the area that this this drone took. Um, 
and uh, we were able to fly this map. I want to say it was less than six minutes. Uh, we had, and then you can pull, if you'll pull us over to the model now. So in six minutes, we had a 3D model uh, ready to be produced um, for command. And why, so why would fast mapping be important? In, well, for us, this situation in regards to planning. Right, because a lot of times we don't know what's happening in the public safety in the world. We, you know, we have to kind of fly by the seat of our pants a lot of times. So just like this incident here, we didn't know this was coming. We get a call saying, hey, listen, we're supposed to have some violent protests going on. Uh, can, you, uh, can you come fly some maps for us so we'll have situational awareness? And so uh, we, we went out like at 1.30, Garrett and I did. We flew three different areas, two of which are this size. Uh, and less than an hour and had 3D models available for command to see before the protest was supposed to take place at five o'clock. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of unheard of and uh, in, in, in other uh, type products of 3D modeling just because it takes so long to process. And I, I, Garrett can speak on the one that he did in Richardson where we, we were out there on a child abduction and it was a bigger area than this or maybe this size. I don't know, Garrett, how big you think, but. No. How long did it take to process that map with the other competitor? And was, took forever. So, so we, we uh, yeah, and that's, that's one of the things. Let me kind of highlight or jump on to what, what Barry was saying. One of the things that we found early on with, with mapping is that oftentimes they need the information yesterday. They need to, they need to become, come up with a current plan. And in this case, you know, you could, you, this is going to be uh, a static, but imagine if this were something of a different nature where there was uh, some change. This They wanted this as part of their pre-planning, but imagine if you had this as post also and you needed to have to be able to measure how far some kind of damage was done, tornado strike, whatever, you know, th there could be a, a bunch of different things. Um, and so what this allows you to do is get, get all of your information, uh, measurable information very quickly. Uh, what Barry was referring to is actually an apartment complex which would be, if you zoom out, it would be about the size of maybe one and a half of those city blocks was the whole apartment complex. And it took us about uh, six hours to map it. And then uh, it took over 24 hours for it to generate, to actually generate the model on the, on the computer. Um, and this was on a, a substantially fast computer, i9, you know, about a $7,000 computer. Um, to, to do that and now we can have stuff like this uh, in what was it, about a half hour from the time it was taken in about six minutes and finished processing and maybe another 20 so in a half hour you have all this information uh, that they can now use yeah that's current that's that's great um, we have John had asked about sky browse and and it's proven accuracy to pix 4d so one of the big things here is while we're we've got it We've got to somehow demonstrate and show folks that are tuning in what 3D mapping and modeling is. And when it comes to speed, um, for the folks that have worked with public safety, that's one of those factors, of, as we've mentioned here. Um, so when we're and then when we talk about accuracy, John asked, is Skybrow has proven to be just as accurate as PIX4D? And I think that um, accuracy is always relative to your operation. So if you're going down to survey grade and you're, you're trying to come in with like machinery surveying and, and different things like that, super, super important. Um, but for um, quick mapping, um, is there anything Garrett or Barry that you wanted to kind of add just in regards? And then also once you say that, um, Sasa uh, asks what UAVs are you using um, to do the mapping and modeling? So for let me let me let me touch on the accuracy real quick. So I did an I did an accuracy uh, test between um, with 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 Pix4D and also with with Skybrows, um, and the accuracy was one for one. In fact, I had someone put a marking out on the street as a firefighter. I had him go mark the area on the street and didn't tell me what the measurement was. He brought a tape measure out there and put a put a measure on the street. And then I went and measured it, and both of them measured uh, 9.1 feet. Right, I just flew the area 9.1 feet, and they were they were the exact same. Now, again, the, I think at this point, what we're what we're seeing with 3D mapping, regardless of 
the uh, of, of what you use on accuracy is is it's really the accuracy of your mouse. At some point, you zoom in, and the very point of your mouse is bigger than anything that you can click. So um, both of them, I would I would say that both of them are, are sub centimeter accuracy. But again, I don't know if I can get sub centimeter with the tip with the point of my mouse. Yeah, that's a super important note that you made in regards to like when you're actually zooming in, um, the, the, it can be this accurate, but how well are you actually capturing your data as well? Because that'll play a role into the overlay of, of imagery and also video as well. So, so one, one of the things I'm going to add, one of the thing comparison that we had is um, I've heard that there's some special techniques and that you basically have to wait till all the planets align if you if you intend to get a dark um you know not well lit area and, and to be able to see any detail one of the things i was really happy to see on sky browse was that in an area like if you if with the one that you just saw that was illuminated by the fox fury lights yep. um Bring that up. you could actually go and see in shadowed areas and i believe that's because and i don't know this this is my assumption is because instead of capturing uh, images every with so much overlap this thing is capturing 30 frames per second so any illuminosity that happens to come off of any angle uh, it's going to to show up in the map see and if you look there's even though everything is well lit you can you can see uh, that there are going to be some areas with shadows but even with that you're still able to see details in this 3d model uh, that was a big factor to me because there was always frustrations, especially in something like an accident like this, that between those vehicles or up in, near the fender well or in the wheel well, that you wouldn't be able to see anything because there was a shadow. But now you or what it was just empty data, black void. Uh, but now you actually are able to get that data. Yeah, that is that is excellent right there. Um, so uh, platforms. What are you using, but what also can you use? Right, we're, we've been using the Mavics, uh, pretty much DJI, any DJI product um, besides the, the, the newest, um, what is it, the Mini that came out. Um, right. Uh, you, Sky Browse is, uh, has the capability of producing a map for you. Uh, right now, we are working with Altel uh, and uh, what I understand is the Altel Evo 2 will eventually will be able to map with it. And I think really soon, according to Bobby. Uh, so that is a that will be an option, uh, and we would like to start working with some other folks as well. Um, Want to work uh, with everybody because you yeah. know everybody needs a map and model, and everyone has all different kinds of drones. Because I would say, um, other than that, like like the Mavic Mavic Pro, you know, if you have a if you have a camera that has a uh, uh, camera. If you have a drone with a camera on it and it can geo uh, tag those images, uh, you know, you could start with some of these other things. But like you said, integrating into SkyBrowse, um, you know, definitely new and building out what platforms are available. Um, if you have a, a drone, start to figure out what you can do because these, these softwares, you know, the way you pull data and put data into them are so familiarizing yourself with the, the workflow, right? How to integrate drones into your um, crash reconstruction process and then also into you know, your pre-planning and, and response calls. I think that's- right. And then that's what kind of makes uh, SkyBrows unique in the fact that you can go to a crash scene, put it up over the crash scene and two minutes have a 3D model of it. Whether or not you want to use it for a court or not is, is that, that's your business. The accuracy of it is going to allow that and to be able to testify to it however but just to have the ability to go up and have a 3d model of any scene that you uh, in a matter of two minutes or so is is uh, really something that's a game changer that you can have that in in your arsenal so um and and then also for standoffs and, and situations like that if you if you get these models in and you can get them in in less than 10 minutes and you're situating your standoff still going to be able to provide a 3d model of a of a house where a standoff is at is, is priceless as well. So um, those are just little things that, you know, will come, come into play when you start thinking about uh, mapping with the drones. Yeah, and that's super interesting because like you said, that house, like that quick response, public safety, easy. Um, I just have to go over to you, Guillaume, and, uh, and kind of, you know what I mean? Because what we're seeing, um, the integration of hardware with software 
um, on your guys' side of things. Um, you know, what, 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 are your, what are your thoughts? What do you want to kind of add a little bit as we close out the, the mapping side here? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, everybody at Skydio loves hearing people talk about software uh, when it comes to drones. We think that that's where all the value is, and, and that's what we're seeing here, right, is look at, look at what you can do in one of these mapping situations if you've got a Mavic versus what you can do if you have a Mavic plus SkyBrows. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Um, and so, so we're really excited about that. Um, we, at, you know, Barry and I have had some conversations about um, making SkyBrows work with Skydio as well. Um, it's going to take a little bit because um, because our SDK, of course, isn't as far along as, as some of the Chinese players, but, um, but we'll get there. Um, and then um, when it comes to doing this modeling, we, uh, with Skydio, you've got some extra potential. And, and about a month ago, we announced uh, a new product called 3D Scan um, that I'll, I'll, I'll try not to make this a commercial for, but you know, we get excited about it because with, with the obstacle avoidance that's on a Skydio drone, you know, anybody who's flown it, you kind of know you can just whip them around and not worry about obstacles. Um, you know, I think about that scene with those two cars, instead of flying one donut around the scene and, and taking video, 3D scan is going to, is going to autonomously have your drone go down and capture every square inch, right? And, and, and fly a really detailed pattern, but not a linear or circular one, um, one that's adaptive to the scene. Um, and so, you know, while those course models for the protest, you're not going to, you don't need that precision in those places where you need the precision. Um, we're working pretty hard to get some new solutions out there. Um, so I'm just a really big fan of everything that um, that Barry and Garrett and, and the guys at SkyBrowser are doing. I think that's um, that's absolutely where the industry needs to go, and and we're starting to see the value of it, which is a great thing. Awesome, awesome. This is great. We had two last to end out this mapping thing. Uh, Bill Imman had asked, is the flight um, automated to achieve that perfect circle? Um, I can go ahead and answer that. Yes, this is an uh, automated flight. And then any success, John asked, producing maps or models from a uh, light that would be mounted to the drone itself? Uh, no, none from us. And we've thought about that, but the, I think the glare and the, I think it's just, it's too much of shadows and, and uh, with the lighting coming from the drone. And because that was my first thing, can we put a spotlight on this thing and, my, and then we don't have to worry about putting lights out on the side of it. Um, and the answer to that was no, just there's too many shadows, it wouldn't work. So there may be something out there, I just don't know. Right on. Um, I'm pretty sure I broke my computer. Uh, which is, um, which is gonna be great for the rest of this presentation. Um, I might be able to pull this off with a modified screen share. Portion of a screen. This is gonna work, guys. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. Does anybody know where whose motto that is? The United States Army. And is that Sharon? Yes. We got a good share there? Okay. So we're gonna move from mapping modeling into uh, utilizing UAS, using drones for suspect search and apprehension. Um, Rick's excited because he's been a little bit quiet over the last few minutes. And uh, he's, he's you know got some great use cases here that we're gonna be able to jump into. So you can go ahead you know, at Rick this time, uh, unmute yourself and get ready to, to, to talk to the folks tuning in. Um, in regards to search and, and suspect search and apprehension, we're seeing drones carrying different cameras. We've got advanced zoom capabilities. We have thermal imaging, um, lighting and speakers, which are all making it harder for suspects to get away. And at the same time, we're introducing drones with advanced obstacle detection and spatial awareness, which is making it easier for law enforcement to locate and apprehend suspects. Um, so basically, if you're a suspect, uh, if you're doing something wrong, it's, it's not going to be getting easier to get away anytime soon. Uh, drones can be an extremely versatile tool when they're incorporated to support the mission. So, Rick, I'm going to jump to this next slide, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and let you kind of talk, talk us through, talk the audience through what we're seeing here. Um, and this, 
this I'll, I'll say is the Evo 2 Dual, just so folks know going into this, this is the Autel Evo 2 Dual with that 640 uh, thermal sensor. So go ahead, Rick. Yeah, this was a uh, call we had actually on this last Sunday night of a flight down at a homeless camp behind one of our shopping centers in a big open field. Uh, it's like technical difficulty again. Well, anyhow, the, uh, it entailed me having to put my officers on foot to go walk out there. So I flew high cover using this hotel. We're able to locate a suspect that really didn't want to be contacted by us as he jumped a guardrail, fled across a freeway into another adjacent neighborhood, ran through a construction site into another neighborhood thinking he got away, and then started trying door, uh, car doors, looking to see what he could recover out of unlock cars or burglarize a car. Able to get him to duck down between two cars in which he actually gained access to a car, then fled into another construction field. I was able to keep this guy in sight without him seeing me because I was about 350 feet up and stayed you know, a few hundred feet behind him out of sight. Directed my units in, and by the time it got done, I looked at it, I was over 5,000 feet away from my origination point at that 300 feet. Luckily, still keep line of sight with the, with the uh, beacon lights, but maxed that thing out to the furthest potential for battery. So unfortunately, I didn't get to see the capture. I got my guys in the location, they got eyes on, gave a foot chase, took them in custody, but that drone had hit auto return by that time because the battery life had expired. But that footage along with that and being able to file that, you know, it's, it's unquestionable evidence. Yeah, we did not recover a gun, but the, the auto, uh, that FLIR is so accurate. If you were to watch that, you'll see a cat run across the field on one occasion. You get yeah. another, you see a rabbit run out of the field. And you can even see his hot footprints going up the hill. That's how intense that camera is on that hotel. We found that not just this use case scenario, but we married this with another pilot I have. He flies a um, Mavic Enterprise Dual, and he'll use that in an MSX mode or in a color mode with the spotlight or speaker mounted on top. In conjunction with the hotel, those two married together are an amazing team when they fly them, you fly them together. As far as locating detection and identifying suspects. Yep, I can see it now. Okay. He's on the guardrail. If you look at the top center up against the roadway, he's contemplating. My officers are down below contact and they spot him. And as soon as they spot him, he decides, I'm out of here. And that's an active freeway. Luckily for him, it was at two o'clock in the morning, not much traffic. Uh, what we found out, if you watch, he was reaching into his backpack right there. And we believe he ended up dumping something right there in the center median, but we went back and didn't locate anything because you see him making a hand gesture and a throwing motion if you go back and watch that video closely. Now he's back in the neighborhoods uh, trying different car door handles as he's walking along. And this is a newly developed neighborhood. So we we're able to guide officers all the way into where he was. And the detail, you can see what was in his hands, exactly what he's doing, he had his backpack. Look at the middle of the screen, it's, he just left that car and he's walking back on the sidewalk. And the advantage is, is you can change the back pallets uh, from white hot to black hot based on the conditions and the time of day and what you're dealing with and weather. This was a warm night. The roadway was carrying a lot of the heat, so I kept it on black hot. So it helped silhouette him a little better. I put it on white hot and blended him out in clear white. So you got to, that's another thing about training. You have to train with this and understand what these capabilities are. You know, can you adjust to a color palette? And some of them, the MSX mode on the, uh, on the Mavic Enterprise, we, we try to do a comparison back and forth. And on the Enterprise, it's not, it's apples and oranges. They're not even comparable. And Rick, like you, I want those two to pay attention to right here on the hill. You're going to see that rabbit glowing up. It's a little black dot right above his head. Dark. I apologize. It's dark. Right. Yep. Guys, we don't have big Texas rabbits like Barry and Garrett will have. These are small little, my daughter calls them bunny foo-foo rabbits. They're about probably, you know, small house pets or the size of a cat. And it picked that detail up and to watch that was amazing. And your ability to maintain visual line of sight, checking your telemetry, knowing, you know, how far off you are. Um, normally this guy gets out into this field at nighttime, you know, he could kind of just 
lay down and, and you know, disappear or just nothing comes of it. You've got to send folks out into that field. Yeah, this is an officer safety nightmare. You send a guy into a field not knowing where he's bedded down, this guy can pop up and do whatever to your officer without knowing. So you're looking at having to send a multi-officer arrest team out, maintain a perimeter at the same time, whereas now I can see if he's got something in his hands if I zoomed in. I can direct my officers in and I know where he's gonna be and they can actually approach from cover and or take cover at the same time, not being surprised because they know where he's at. So again, as I mentioned before, this is an officer safety enhancement. It's gonna save lives. And it's one of the biggest tools it has to go with. And if you were to lead a canine in, I can clear the canine for obstacles and let that canine know exactly where he's at, help that handler on trail and go that route. And if I had a conjunction with a, we practice with our ME2s with the speaker to audibly make that canine announcement over the suspect at the same time. And not only the handler making the announcement, the drones making the announcement. So now I got witnesses as far as I can hear, hear that announcement and bad guy's gonna hear it because if the handler, you know, 25 yards away hears it, that guy has to hear it. This video here, you're leading into, I uh, actually made national news. Um, this was a SWAT hit on a house for a shooter that was related to a Halloween homicide shootout at an Airbnb in the city of Orinda. This is one of the suspects. As he's circling around, as we're making entry to the front, we have a full perimeter on the block. If you look at the top of the screen, you'll see more uh, uh, detective units. We have units all the way around. Well, he decides to take the leap of faith out of a second story window, think he's gonna get away. Um, he jumps out that window. I hate to be a spoiler alert, because we're at the front door bringing the family out, getting ready to make entry from the front. But when we train, we train with two drones for Overwatch. Those in the tech, tactical world understand you name the sides one, two, three, and four. I'll put a drone at the one, two corner, and a three, four corner. In other words, the front corner opposite and this back corner here. And that gives you a full view, 360 of the residents. You can see him dropping the screen and going to drop out the window. Well, this is an active gang member out of the city of Oakland and a very active shooter. Um, he's involved in multiple other shootings in different cities. They know about him. And he decides he thinks he's going to try to get away. Well, he, unbeknownst to him, there's three canines on our perimeter waiting to have him come out and greet them. And well, he, he, I'm sorry? I'd say Rick, the video's cut off, but he is going to continue behind the back of this house and he hides in the tree line right there. Yeah, he goes on the rear of the residence. He hides in that tree line, so we go into a low hover. When this happens, I transition up to a, an overwatch because we practice this. One is a pursuit drone, we only have two at the time, the other one goes to overwatch. So I immediately climb up to altitude to give a full overview so he doesn't escape. At the same time, he actually surrendered to the drone. We ordered him out, put your hands up, there's dogs gonna get you, we have officers here, you're not getting away. So we tell him again, put your hands up, he puts his hands up. And how important is it to having eyes on this individual, watching him now give himself up, while well, you have you know, a team of folks that otherwise would have had to you know, enter that house? Well, we'd have to clear the house first, secure that we have no one else in there gonna take care of us. Then we have to clear this yard, because if you look at the back windows of that house, it creates an officer safety issue of maybe a sniper in that window waiting for officers and they're playing a game. There were multiple shooters at this Halloween shooting. Uh, we actually were one of, I believe, six search warrants served simultaneously this morning in different jurisdictions. So we were able to order this gentleman out and our team was able to take him into custody without any incident. And it was a very successful op. We cleared the house, recovered a firearm, got him into custody and went from there. And nobody got hurt. That's excellent. Hey Rick, what drone was this? This was actually the Mavic Enterprise uh, duels. I'm sorry, Zooms. We used our Zooms on that with our speakers attached. And I was going to ask you, Rick, are you giving any, giving any commands, kind of letting these folks know, like, we can see you? Um, I mean, other than the normal, um, you know. Well, uh, when we have the speakers and they're going to bed down, we do, we do let them know. We see you. We describe him. We call him by name. You're behind the blue trash can on the corner of the house. Right. John Doe, you come out with your hands up. You won't be hurt. If not, the canine is going to come in and or other measures may be used against you. Because, you know, we, we, like you said, you've got units surrounding this property. 
Yeah, he wasn't going to go nowhere. And all he was going to do was going to bring the level up. If he's hiding, anyone in law enforcement knows, he's at the advantage. He's going to decide when he's going to react. We're at the disadvantage because we have to approach. This actually took away all the risk. And goodness, if we can uh, go ahead, keep, keep, just keep, uh, you were mentioning taking away the risk. Yeah, it's, the, as anyone who's been in the law enforcement and are under a fire, um, these just enhance the safety. It enhances uh, how you can address it, command decisions being made. Because this is, I have a, a truck set up. I got command staff that's actually looking at monitors and seeing it live. And they're able to make on the spot command decisions, not waiting for radio chatter about what's going on and then try to build the picture in their head. They see that picture live. So at the same time, we're streaming this to all involved units. Our snipers are getting that straight on a tablet that they have with them. Um, my SWAT commander inside the truck is seeing it live, so he gives live commands as well. The team operators have their phones on little bands on their arms. They're seeing it live as they're making entry. So we're flying, we'll fly interior flight. When I send that drone around the corner, he's not going around the corner blind. He knows what's around that corner when he comes. There's a couch, there's a table. There's a down, and if we had a shooting homicide scene or an active shooter, we know we have a person down right here. So we take away that risk and let them address it. Do we need to bring a shield up? Do we need to pop a flashbang? Do we need to use smoke? Do we're going to retreat out? How are we going to deal with this? So this only enhances the operation and most of all, the safety of the operation. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, Tidiano is asking, yes, the webinar will be available, uh, made available afterwards. Are the officers in the field able to see a live video feed from the drone? And you may have kind of covered that. There's multiple different apps out there um, that allow that to happen. Um, different agencies have their preferences. We use an app called AirData um, just because we tried to build our own using encoders and all this other stuff, and it just wasn't successful. We were talking about a nine to 15 second latency problem and in nine to 15 seconds, the event could be over in nine seconds. So right now, what we're using now gives us a zero to one second latency and 90% of the time it's live over a first net cell net connection. No fancy IT needed. Um, it's all cell when they can see it live. I'd say there's hardware and software solutions available that will allow you to push that video feed out right through, whether it's through the cell service of the screen itself or feeding that into some sort of hardware, um, some sort of box, right? Like an AMV uh, Insight RT box. So those solutions are out there. Um, and, and like you said, air data, AMV, it just kind of depends on, you know, budget and then what's right for your um, operation. Yeah, we're using this and pumping this out on live calls. Um, if, uh, we, the way we have it set up, we can deploy, deploy a drone within minutes of being on scene. Yeah. We're preset pre in the back of the car. We go airborne immediately and we start pushing that out to arriving units. So it's an in-progress call. They got all the intel visual as quickly as possible including my dispatch. That's great. I want to move to this one more video because it's going to transition to the end. We've had a really great discussion and uh, we're, we're kind of, we're going to end up running over a little bit. So if all the panelists are okay with that um, and to the folks tuning in, if you have to check out, this is going to be made available afterwards. So um, right here, Rick, this, this video, Uh, this incident, what it's going to do is this video is going to show how this drone, it's up high, you've got uh, different capabilities, but at some point, sometimes a suspect may enter into an area that has covering um, or, you know, some type of, some type of covering that's even going to eliminate, and it looks like this isn't even playing right. Well, while you're getting this going, the backstory on this is, we have a vehicle suppression team and we've gone after this guy on four different occasions and every occasion he's evaded by pursuit and then crash in the car. And every time we recover some type of firearm that he discards either in the vehicle or nearby. Uh, we DNA and got his DNA on all the firearms recovered. This one, we had information. He was at an apartment complex and 
we went up with also a fixed wing. That fixed wing was able to provide high cover and I flew with the drone. As expected, he ran over a fence through multiple yards, ended up ditching a gun in a backyard in a trash can along with a backpack full of his narcotics that if we had not had the drone up, we never would have seen him discard that at all. But at the same time, this was a 20 minute foot pursuit in about four city blocks that have no cross streets. That's about the side of the area in Old Town. And he was hitting yard to yard to yard, but would never come out. So our perimeter constantly shifted until we could pin him into one yard. On several occasions, he actually was on the opposite side of the fence where an officer was, where a lot of officers are killed going over a fence blind. I was able to tell my officer, hold, he's right there, do not go over. And we rused him out, got him running again, finally got him into a yard that he was boxed in, and condensed or collapsed our perimeter around it, got him in the yard, took him into custody with no one being injured. Able to go back with the video evidence, recover that firearm, DNA it, had his DNA all over it, got that filed along with the other cases. So he's looking at an extensive prison sentence, and it was basically due because this video captured all that. Otherwise, he would have gotten away. And like I said, he, he was in it to win it. He ran, and he ran very hard. You can see him in the center of the screen. There's an officer going to come down, try to confront him. He takes off again. And he's very aware of his surroundings and what's happening and that folks are closing in. Um, when you're up high here, you get, you get a lot of tree, right, and coverage, in, especially in some of these yards here where you've got some type of overgrowth. So I think a great point uh, for folks that are starting to leverage and use drones is what can you pay attention to um, other than the suspect that's, that's running that's going to cue you into what's happening? And I would say look at backyards, right? Watch dogs. Because as people are jumping and going over these fences, you see a lot of activity from e either cats, right? You'll see cats jump and run. So while you can't visually see, like here, he just pops out again. You could have seen right here in the video that these dogs are very active. Um, and those are indicators that'll help you maintain uh, uh, an idea of where this individual's at. And I don't know why this video is cutting short here, but what happens is this individual clears this fence and then comes into this uh overhang hidden area here um correct sergeant uh smith yeah that is correct and he actually gets uh root he actually makes it back out of that and there's a tree to the right along that pole out just to the right he actually ends up climbing that tree okay. so we ended up between myself and the other air unit were able to lock him in get him locked in that yard and it took some issue to get him out of that tree but he eventually came down Great. great. What I wanted to is, is where the video I had ended was with him entering this overhang hidden space where even with yes. the imaging, you're not going to pick up on this individual. Uh, right. So what we're seeing, um, and Guillaume, uh, if you didn't like uh, jump out on us here, uh, hopefully I know we got people a little bit past the time. Uh, but uh, for, for scenarios where you can't just maintain that higher up uh, situation, what we've seen recently within public safety is the introduction of the CPLA uh, waiver, that close proximity to waiver. Um, can you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this clip, Guillaume, and what it's gonna do is it's really gonna show uh, how this Skydio, well, it was supposed to play. Sure, no worries. There, there was another video that um, that we were looking at as well uh, that that might help with this. But um, you know, yeah, all, you can bring that up. These Overwatch capabilities are fantastic. I mean, I'm just sitting here, um, just amazed at at, at the way that uh, Rick, you're able to make these cases so much safer. Um, you know, I, I think the next frontier um, is to be able to fly lower, right? And like you said, you know, you've got. Uh, you've got one drone on your one two corner, one on your three four corner. One's um, one's up high flying Overwatch, and the other one's in pursuit. Well, that pursuit um, is tough. It takes a lot of flying, and and it sounds like you've got uh, some pretty amazing pilots over there. Um, but you know, there's 36,000 agencies in the U.S., and and they don't all have uh, pilots as good as as the Antioch PD. Some of them do for sure. Um, and so, 
um, that's a big motivation for us with Skydio is, is when you can fly without having to worry about obstacles, um, you can come down low um, and get under overhangs, go into trees um, and not worry about crashing into branches um, or leaves because the drone is taking care of that for your pilot. And so- We have this screen up, Guillaume. Uh, I can see your I can see your PowerPoint deck. PowerPoint, okay. Uh, I just want to make sure, folks. You know, we do the because uh, I introduced the CPLA, but what it is, right? And I think I'm yeah. getting ahead of you here. Yeah, no, no, I'm right with you. So the the goal of the goal of the CPLA um, is to take that low altitude flight where you're down among these obstacles and make it legal, because um, it's really easy to stay compliant with the FAA when your drone's 150 feet up and you can see it over a house. Um, that you're serving a warrant at. But if you're going down into the backyard, it's harder to maintain line of sight. Now in an emergency situation, you have some leeway. Um, but what we did at Skydio is go and work with the Chula Vista Police Department because um, they like to have their DJI M210s up high and their Skydios down low um, and help them get a close proximity, low altitude waiver um, that as long as they stay below 50 feet above ground level and within 1500 feet of the pilot, they can do whatever they need to. Um, without having to file a notum um, or or look for any other permissions, so that's that's something we're really excited about. It's something that um, yeah, the yeah, I'm up this YouTube video, yeah, yeah, but it's something that the conversation largely started around the Skydio autonomy engine. Um, but something we're really proud of and excited about is that the the waiver itself doesn't mention Skydio um, or AI, right? It's something that the entire industry can use. Um, so we highly encourage everybody to, to look for ways that you can use these low altitude flights um, in places where you, you really wouldn't fly any other drone uh, without a serious emergency or a ton of pilot training um, to get down in these tight nooks and crannies, but do it legally. Um, and you can, you can get that permission, whether you're flying a Skydio or you're, um, you know, flying one of the, one of the Mavics like we saw earlier. Um, so we're we're really excited for it and 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 think it'll do a lot of good out there. Like right here, I'd say is good to be able to to see into an area like this, right? Know what's behind there before a team rolls through and and has to find it themselves. Hey, hey G, I wanted I wanted to say, say okay, I'm not even going to try to say your name. I'm just going. <laughs> oh, G's okay. Um, there's some times. <laughs> Hey, one thing, one thing to take back to to Skydio. We've been really looking forward to. It. Actually, it, it'd be it'd be good to uh, have up. To work with y'all at some time, but and, and Skydio is killing everybody in it. Oh, can y'all hear me? I'm breaking up. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Is is interior flight. So as uh, Sergeant Smith said earlier, that's that's a huge thing. Robots, I mean, honestly, let's, let's talk real. They have their application, but comparatively, they, they stink, right? They, the uh, UAS can just go and navigate through a building, something like a school building or an office building, so much faster. Now, one of the things I've been really looking for to come from Skydio is the ability to quickly uh, have to navigate inside a building, like an office building, like a school, all those sensors and everything you have there, um, it's almost like you could you could press a button, say, track this hallway, and just give a full right stick forward. I mean, blast through there 30 miles an hour if you had to, ahead of the SWAT team. That's been the big challenge, is it takes a lot of practice, as Sergeant Smith and Barry Moore can attest to, to fly fast enough to stay ahead of the team and provide them awareness, um, but I, I think with your technology that Skydio has, that's doable. And hopefully y'all can y'all can uh, actually put a little R and D into that. I'm, I'm fingers crossed on that. Oh, Garrett, Garrett, you're you are dead on. Message received. We um we actually have a product coming out uh, later this year that should solve both of those problems. So the reason you fourth don't quarter, see it right? fourth quarter. That's right, Q4. The reason you don't see a lot of Skydio twos flying indoors. Um, is that the drone actually sets itself up a big obstacle bubble. Um, so you've got, you've got your bird, right? And you've got a meter on each side of it. Um, and that makes it hard to fit through doors and get indoors uh, or get inside of a building. Um, well, we've got a new feature coming out that we're calling precision mode um, that lets you um, scramble down that obstacle margin 
uh, to a half meter, which gets you through a standard doorway. It's probably not gonna let you push through uh, the broken glass like we saw um, at that gas station earlier in the video, but it'll get you in the doorway. Um, and once you're in there, once you're inside, flying a Skydio 2 is amazing because um, you're not dependent on GPS or a magnetometer, right? You're using, you're using these cameras uh, to do your navigation. Um, and then you can just full right stick forward and not hit anything. It's awesome. We, um, you know, one of my all-time favorite Skydio pilot is John Wakey at the FDNY. Um, and he was, he calls me the other day and he says, hey, you ever fly your Skydio 2 through an orchard? Um, I say, no, what's it like? And he says, I couldn't tell you. I had my eyes closed because um, he just went full right stick forward and full right stick back. Um, and, you know, we like to quote dodgeball. We say the drone will just dodge, duck, dip, dive and dodge uh, around all those obstacles. Um, so, so, you know, you're absolutely dead on. Uh, we can't wait to get that feature out there. And it's one that um, it's one that we decided to build uh, because of all the feedback that folks like yourself have given to, to Fritz and myself. So um, definitely appreciate it. We do take all these things back and, um, and try to bring them to the market as soon as possible. And the balance of safety versus the ability to do more, right? Because like you said, in order to have that, that we're not going to hit anything, we've got to ensure, right, you're, you're, that you're so far away. Uh, the closer you get, the, the more difficult it becomes to really, right, guarantee that, that this drone's not going to come into contact with anything. Um, which is why it's even interesting, like I showed it for the future of indoor uh, UAS ops is, is a drone that maybe can also take that impact um, and push, push through, right? Um, so yeah, that's great, man. I appreciate um, everybody having come on. We don't, um, we don't have any more questions. There's something that came through uh, by, uh, Chris Cody in regards to like indoor flight drones that they're working on. Um, but no, no questions missed here, which is great. Um, what I do want to bring up and I have to bring up is, uh, I'm going to bring up this awful PowerPoint slide one more time, guys, just bear with me. Um, again, thanks to the panelists for coming on for those folks tuning in. Um, this is a webinar series with 910 Drones, Fox Fury, Insight Fire Training, and FLIR. Um, so two weeks from today, we're going to have our UAS in Disaster Response Operations webinar. Um, there's been quite a few, right? It's, it's a hot topic with the hurricanes coming through, especially for us here in North Carolina. And um, uh, I think, I don't know, I don't want to say anything that I don't know, but I think maybe in Texas, you know, things, things are getting active more now. Is, it, is that the time? Hey, hey, let's not put that in the universe in 2020. Okay, never mind. I apologize. Everything's good out there. So, uh, everything's good here. Everything is good here. Everything's good there. All right. Well, here, here we're preparing for disasters. So any, anyone else preparing for disasters, uh, check it out. We'll, we'll be putting out the link and information um, to anyone that had tuned in and registered here. Um, again, thanks to Insight Fire Training, Fox Fury, FLIR, 910 Drones um, for helping us get all these great panelists and putting this together. Um, I want to thank uh, you, the audience, for tuning in, and I want to thank uh, each of our panelists. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Guillaume. Um, we really appreciate your time and attention, and our audience really appreciates your time and attention. Uh, to the audience, uh, please take a look here and Barry, Garrett, Rick, if you guys want to just send your emails out in the chat so that people can do a copy paste, um, that'll be great. But even those folks that are tuning in and watching this recording, um, reach out to these folks. Um, reach out to Barry, Garrett, Rick, Guillaume if you have questions um, about what's happening. If you have questions about what you saw in this webinar, they will answer them, but you have to reach out. Um, so again, thank you. Um, just thank you to everybody, um, the participants, the panelists, um, and the, the folks that supported putting this on. Um, what I want to do, and because I don't want to just leave, leave it, and I, and I you know, uh, I want to give you guys an opportunity to just give a last kind of word, um, Barry. So just something real quick, just, you know, let folks know uh, from this webinar what they can take. Absolutely. Just, I, I would like to, I just want to say that, you know, we've been, we've been using drones for a while now and the technology just keeps getting better and better. 
uh, don't just sit on, you know, what you got. There's, there's things out there that'll, that are just making uh, public safety a lot safer. And uh, as you can see with what Rick's doing and, and uh, everybody in the panel's doing, this is just, um, you know, really the tip of the iceberg. And I, uh, like I said, it's, it's so interesting and I, I enjoy every bit of it. So thanks for having me and I appreciate everybody that's on here. Thanks, Barry. Garrett? Yes, I, I agree with Barry. What, this, is, this is pretty exciting. And, and what really motivates me in all this is to save lives, save property, keep officers and firefighters and all responders uh, safer in this. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been crazy actually seeing lives saved. And you look at those videos that uh, Sergeant Smith shared with us, and that just highlights um, everything that we've seen. Uh, what I look forward to is a lot of people right now, a lot of folks out there, well, where are we at? The, the reality is we're just getting started in this. Um, this is going to end up changing the world um, for some of us it already has. And uh, I really look forward to all the future technologies um, coming out as the needs get fulfilled and uh, applications get identified. So thank you for having me on. Uh, hopefully I was able to provide some useful information there. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Garrett. Uh, Rick? As I keep telling my guys, the only way you can make this industry better is by sharing. If you find something new that works, put it out there. Let people know about it, and then we can work on it as a team and perfect it. At the same time, I cannot insist enough. Train, train, train. Burn those batteries. Electricity don't cost much. A lot cheaper than uh, fuel in a helicopter. Or uh, the biggest thing is these things save lives. Uh, us in law enforcement, I get chills talking about it. I've been to too many funerals already. And if this saves one life, all this time and effort is worth it. And that's all it takes. So again, to get good at this, share what you do, always push the limits and test. You come up with something new, test it out, try it. Think out of the box. Don't say what works, find something else, re-innovate it. I'm talking with Antonio regularly about things that work and don't work. Um, us at LAC, RTC, we're pushing the limits every chance we can, you know. Chris had a crazy idea, let's break a window. He filled a tennis ball full of, you know, porcelain off of a spark plug and try to smack it with an autel. He realized all he would do is flip the autel. But how would you know? You have <laughs> to test it. It's a great video, it's actually quite funny. But it's, it showed how robust the autel is. But like I said before, train, 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 and share. Don't keep it to yourself. That's how this industry is gonna get better. Yeah, that's appreciate that, Rick. And you definitely shared with us some really, really good uh, footage from, from use cases. Um, Guillaume, uh, go right ahead and take it away. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's hard to know what to say because I'm sitting here starstruck. I feel like I, I just met the president or something. But all you, know, all you guys are going to be remembered as heroes, right? Barry, Rick, and Garrett. Um, you know, the creativity and the grit and the tenacity that it takes to get a program going in such a young market uh, with such a new technology is is really something we're celebrating. Um, and especially the fact that you guys are willing to come and share it, um, it it's amazing. And it's inspiring to a lot of other programs and, and also to myself. I dropped out of grad school uh, to join Skydio uh, because of stories like the ones that you guys told today. Um, so, you know, I personally just can't thank you guys enough for your role in it. And uh, you've got me fired up to go back to the workday here and uh, do everything we can at Skydio to make you know, better and easier um, and more scalable technologies so that one day it doesn't take guys who are as, as tenacious and, and creative as you guys um, to make these drone programs happen and, and have all the positive impacts that, that you guys are already realizing. Um, so, so thanks for today, guys. I, I really enjoyed the session. Hey, thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, that, was, uh, that was really, really great. Thank you all for, for kind of closing the hat out. Um, uh, again, audience, you appreciate it. You have the contact information for these guys. Reach out, ask questions. And like Rick said, share, share, share your positive experiences, uh, share your negative experiences. That's something that we're probably going to end up doing here on this webinar just off of what we heard now is, is, is showing people what doesn't work just as much as we can show people what does work. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, you know, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, reach out if you have questions. Thanks to Insight, Fire Training, FLIR, uh, Fox Fury, 910 Drones. Um, have a good one, everybody.